<laughs> All right, guys, today we're going to take a look at my comprehensive multi-day survival kit broken down and expanded to the best of my abilities. Now, before we get into the actual kit for the full-on multi-day, it's important, at least I feel, to go over the base and the ultimate core of the multi-day survival kit. Now, if you've already watched my video discussing like the ultimate personal survival kit and essentially the core essentials for survival, then you can basically just fast forward to I will try to leave a time frame somewhere around here to that point where you can go and watch uh, this kit. But if you haven't, let's go over the core survival stuff first. So first off, the basis to all of my survival endeavors and just in general whenever I'm going out into the wilderness is my PSK or personal survival kit. This is a Maxpedition Janus pocket extension as it's technically called and it is jammed. I mean, some people will look at this thing expanded and wonder how I get so much stuff in here. It does take skill but this thing is jam-packed there's also a light duty medical kit in the front kind of pouch right here as you guys can see and then there is a rescue link 400 or acr rescue link 400 personal locator beacon down here now remember when we talk about survival the biggest element to successful survival isn't how long you can survive but how fast you can get rescued and so that is the sole goal of this personal survival kit there are there are multiple ways of starting fire in here. There is a shelter, but the big thing is signaling and making sure that your location is known. So the personal locator beacon is what I would consider something that very few survivalists, died in the wool survivalists talk about, but things like the ACR rescue links, the Garmin inreaches, the spot devices have been around for decades now. And I would consider if you are genuinely calling yourself a survivalist and you're not talking about personal locator beacons, you, you're your validity should be questioned. I will say that much. I don't want to get this or turn this into some, you know, argument, but it is just the truth. Anyways, aside from the personal survival kit, I also carry a full-on survival knife. This one is the Chris Reeve Knives Pacific. On top of the Pacific or in this kind of setup, I also have a ferrocerium rod to the side, and then I also have a Leatherman Surge multi-tool in here. This is my full kind of belt knife survival kit, or this is my full-on belt knife setup, and it allows a great deal of multifunction in addition to you're seeing that hyper-redundancy. There are fire starting methods in here. There are fire starting methods on the... Um, on the knife for that reason. There is hyper redundancy here. Okay, next one up is going to be a saw. Now this is a Silky Gomboy, and this is usually my go-to saw for survival. I also have a Baco Laplander that I will use interchangeably. To be honest, I field tested both extensively, and they perform pretty similar. The Silky is just a little bit faster in cutting. Next to that too, what will also be carried on me or on, around my body is going to be a hatchet or an axe. So for this, I just have my wildlife hatchet from GBA, but I will also, if the need be, I will transition or flex up to a GBA Scandinavian or Scandi Forest Axe. Then lastly, rounding it off is going to be a revolver of sorts now, or usually some form of a wildlife handgun. Now, sometimes I will alternate depending on what the situation is and the likelihood of encountering large dangerous game up to a rifle or shotgun. But by and large, I will always make sure that I have something for wilderness defense. And in this case, I just have my Smith & Wesson Model 29 in 44 Magnum. And once again, something that is appropriate to, to take on the critters that are around you is what I will carry. So this one is set up in a drop leg holster setup. I've shown it before. I've talked about handguns multiple times, um, so I won't go into this one too much. But that forms essentially the core base of what's on my belt or what, like I have different loops for hanging hatchets and knives and stuff like that. So this is what will be either on my belt or on my body somewhere. So that is the core basis to that. Now we look at the multi-day survival kit. So this is it in its stock state. And what I mean by that is that for those who don't know or haven't watched the channel, this kit, as you see it here, lives with a few other goodies in my truck constantly year round. And it does alternate between winter and summer. This of course is its winter setup. And this is how I leave it in its stock state. Now, if I was, say my truck was, you know, a total loss and I had to move off position from my truck to mean survival or get survival, um, or to, you know, 
for whatever reason, for whatever objective, if I had to leave my truck, then all of this system is designed to be packed into this backpack. So before we get into what I'm holding right here, this backpack right here is, like I said, the backbone of the multi-day survival kit. And it is a Mystery Ranch Crew Cab is what it's called. And uh, this is the older edition, but still very cool, still awesome in multi-cam. So let's jump into before we get into this backpack, this guy right here. For those who don't know, this is a zero degree sleeping bag. This is a down. This one, I believe, I want to say is Mountain Hardware. Yes, it's Mountain Hardware. This is what it looks like. And some people are probably wondering why I leave it in this big bag and why it's so large. The compression sack is actually in here, but because this lives literally in my truck for like nine months out of the year, if you compress down bags for extended durations, that'll cause a lump and inconsistent um, points of down in your sleeping bag. So it's really best to leave it in an uncompressed state. This is, this is its natural uncompressed state. And of course, after uses, it does get aired out to keep it in good working health, right? But when it's sitting around in its non or stock state, it is left like this. And like I said, I usually just cradle it like this in the back seat of the truck. So if I do, once again, need to leave the truck for whatever reason, I would take this out, put it in its compression sack, and then put it in the pack. The pack does have room for all of this stuff. It's just doesn't make any sense to leave this in a compressed state and damage it over the course of the year. So anyways, that is what this is. I'm going to put it away so we can talk about everything else. All right, so that was the sleeping bag. Of course, that's not necessarily the order you're gonna use your sleep system in, but that is just what I have where it's at. Now, looking at this a little bit more, we have a few parts to shelter. So the first part is I have a UGQ or Underground Quilt Company. Um, I'm trying to remember, this is a Winter Dream 11, if I remember correctly. I've had this thing for like five years, but this is an asymmetrical tarp, and this is primarily originally designed for hammock camping, but the thing I like about asym tarps like this guy is you can set them up in a wide degree of fashions and setups, and they are, this one especially, being that it is a winter dream this is a four season rated asim tarp so you can set it up in a wide variety of different ways to get it to shed snow so if you are in a heavy snow load situation and you need extra kind of um, usability out of your uh, normal shelter system having an asim tarp to balance it works very well all right so then moving into it we're gonna look at the actual shelter setup. So, of course, part of this keeping it like low profile, this piece folds in like this, but it folds out when I wanna use it. So a couple things we have here, as it's wanting to spill out, is we have the, what is this? The mattress pad or the air pad for the sleeping bag. Of course, if you wanna use a down sleeping pad effectively, or bag, sorry, you need a mattress pad. So this is a, Thermarest Neo Air. This is the Xtreme or X Therm. It's the one that has like a 6.4 or 6.1 R rated or rated R value. So it is use, useful for cold weather environments. All right, so aside from that, of course, you need something over your head to protect you from everything, and that is where this guy comes into play. So this guy is not the fanciest or the best, but this is a Gosh, I'm trying to remember. I think it's Alps Mountaineering Zephyr or Zephyr One Person. And the reason why I chose this guy is because it is very robust. It, now, Alps Mountaineering doesn't necessarily pride themselves on making four season tents. And so this may not be the best tent for winter specifically, but it is very robust. It is very tough. And it's a, a very compact, super simple and easy, fast shelter to set up. So it is a tent. It is the Alps Mountaineering Zephyr one-person tent. And once again, to balance its weaknesses in snow loading, that's why we have the ASIM tarp. Now, that basically finishes up most of what's in this core large panel of the crew cab. Of course, there is some paracord in here as well. There is a lot of paracord around here. You know, there's paracord on the knife that we talked about, paracord in the PSK, paracord in the pack. Once again, a lot of it has to do with hyper redundancies. 
So then moving over to the kind of external layer, we'll get to these uh, little pods in a little bit, but moving over to this external layer, the first external layer is going to have the kind of small portion of the cook kit. So we have a BSA or Boy Scouts of America, like old school uh, mess kit here. I love these mess kits. I have a few of them wandering on around, but they are super solid. They are aluminum, so you do have to be cautious with how hot you get them, but they, for what they are, for the weight and size, it is super hard to beat those BSA kits. So that's what's in this very external pouch. And then moving into the more, uh, the more interior but still exterior pouch is going to be the full on kind of, I guess, meal system. So there's not just, um, there's not just like MRE styled foods, but there's all kinds of foods in here. So we have some, you know, generic cliff bars of varying flavors and stuff. There are some granola bars as well. In addition, there are, you know, freeze dried meals in here, quite a few freeze dried meals. Um, there's about five or six of them in here, plus some freeze dried snacks. And a lot of this has to do with maintenance of like, so food isn't necessarily super necessary, more so in the cold than in the warm, but it's not super necessary. But what it really is about is maintenance of kind of quality of life or the mental game of survival. I've talked about this in other videos before, but really it's more about, you know, building that kind of like, peace of mind, so to speak. So that's why there is, you know, freeze dried meals in here. And then of course, the thing that I forgot to mention is that there is no water on board in this pack due to the fact that this is a cold soaked pack. So there is water kept externally in the truck. So it's in the truck, but not in this kit. And the reason why I do that is because if you guys are familiar with areas that get severely cold, as I mentioned, this is a cold soaked pack. And so what I mean by that is it's meant to get down to negative 40, negative 50. And so I keep water externally in the truck, but not in the kit. So if I needed to take this kit out, I would take or I would load water bottles down in this kit, but I do not have standing water in here because uh, the water bottles and such can rupture, they can break as water freezes, it obviously expands. And so I don't keep any water in here to prevent water leakage and then, you know, potential saturation of any part of this kit with water and then it refreezing or just saturating the kit. So that is something important to note. I almost forgot to mention, but yeah, so that is the food setup. There is, once again, like it probably looks like there's extra room in here and that is once again to accommodate for the water that would be put in here. So anyways, it's important to note, um, the water is kept externally, but still in the truck. So if need be, I can load this pack down with extra water. All right, so, let me see if I can get this to sit or play reasonably nice. So next we have these pods, or I don't really know what you wanna call them. I call them pods, and that's just because that's what they look like. So this first one here, once again, is a continuation of the freeze-dried meals. People are gonna wonder, okay, you have water you know, in the truck, you take that with you, how are you gonna heat it? It is through this whole system. So this whole jet boil lives in here, and this is a whole setup. So you have an extra large jet boil uh, of gas here, and then you have the actual jet boil itself. Now this is a, uh, I believe they call this like the Zip 0.75 or something. It's not quite a liter size, but once again, as you guys can see, I have to put this whole system in this area. So I had to have something that was a little bit smaller than the standard jet boils to be able to fit in this pod. All right, and then into this other pod, there isn't actually that much. And once again, I try to keep this kit reasonably open because part of this will be getting filled by external sources. So, you know, like I will be putting water in this if I need to leave the truck, I would be adding things like an ax or other things like that to this kit if I needed to leave or depart my vehicle. So this pack isn't packed to the brim or filled to the gills um, with stuff for that reason specifically. So the last piece is this kind of two for deal here. And I have some instant coffee down here as you guys can hopefully see. Um, once again, quality of life things, you know, caffeine isn't the most important thing in the world, but it's nice to have. And then I have a stainless steel GSI um, 
what is this like cup and then I have the stainless steel Nalgene. So lots of redundancy for cooking stuff, but everything kind of serves its own role. So these two, um, so this like whole bottle system is going to be better for actually like getting water, filtering water if I run out of water um, because once again not that much is kept in the truck like about five water bottles like just standard plastic water bottles of water are kept in there so it's not a huge amount of water so for multi-day ventures you're going to need something to take the water from around you and heat it up. So this is kind of to balance out the pitfall of the of the jet boil. The jet boil system is very effective, but it's very limited. You can't also run a jet boil over open flame. So that's where this guy kind of comes in. And some people might say, but didn't you just talk about the um, Boy Scouts of America mess kit? Yes, I did. But once again, um, that doesn't have any bottles in it for boiling water. So that's where that stainless steel bottle kind of fits into everything. So a little bit redundant. But yeah, now as always guys, I definitely would appreciate to hear any feedback, other things that are in this kit, and I didn't dig into like every single thing, um, but there is like a mess kit with like fork, spoon, stuff like that for eating. Obviously you don't even necessarily need it. You could fashion that stuff with the knife and different kit here, but you know, that stuff is a part of this. So anyways, that's the basic overview of this. Once again, um, you know, some people are gonna sit here and say that, uh, some people are gonna sit here and say that, you know, like, oh, you should include this or that, or, you know, tons of different things. But I really do try to keep this reasonably small scale. And for that, and I try to do that for the reason that ultimately, once again, my idea or my premise to survival isn't so much that, you know, I'm trying to survive outdoors for a, an extended duration of time, but really I'm trying to just have the sheer essentials that I need to be able to keep myself alive so that by the time rescue comes, I'm still alive. So that's where a lot of the kind of philosophy of use comes for this kit. This kit isn't, like I said, designed to be like, oh, you can go outside and survive for two years with this kit. Like if that was the design premise, I could build a kit probably with this crew cab to do that, but that was never really the design intention. That was never really the design intention of this kit or setup. So I think it's important to clarify that because I know that there'll be people in the comments, like I said, when I ask for suggestions, people are like, oh, you know, you can carry this, 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 and this. And it's like, those are great suggestions. I do appreciate them, but uh, I do try to keep this fairly limited and well-regulated to stuff that I'm going to genuinely need in a, you know, multi-day survival. So we're talking, you know, like up to four to five days is like where I'm really looking at for this kit and so that's where you know having extra ability to purify more water than you know three days worth of water will allow or stuff like that comes into play. So anyways guys hopefully you enjoyed this video hopefully you enjoyed taking a look at this kit in the pack loadout setup overall and hopefully it was useful and you learned a thing or two about this whole multi-day survival essentials like i said i try to keep it fairly limited even though i know i said this is like comprehensive it is comprehensive for multiple days but it's not like covering every single base or what if it's just the most realistic outlook of a survival kit so it just covers a lot of the generalized bases and core essential needs which are shelter food warmth and water so those are at the core what you really need to scratch out a living until survival or rescue comes. So anyways, guys, hopefully you enjoyed the video. Hopefully you enjoyed taking a look at this and going over the core fundamentals of the personal survival kit. As always, guys, God bless, and I'm out.